What's going on guys, it's Pastor Josh. I'm so glad that you decided to visit either our website or our Fellowship Community app to watch the message today. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, we would love for you to join us in financially giving to support it. Uh, you can do that either in the link in the comment section below, or you can visit our website or our app to be able to take part in that. I uh, hope you enjoy the message. Have a great day. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, you guys look excited to be here. How about that weather this morning? Isn't it amazing? Is it still cool outside? Is it? See, 63 was amazing. I know that fall doesn't start in Louisiana until about January, but uh, praise God that it's a little cooler this morning. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's something to behold, really. Uh, we've got some rain coming our way, too, so praise God for that as well. If any of y'all got little crops and stuff, I'm trying to learn how to do a little bit of farming. Uh, pray for me. But uh, <laughs> if you came in, we're so glad you're with us this morning. If you came in, you should have received a worship guide. If you did not, make sure to grab one on the way out. Um, and not just for the notes, but just for the information that's found within. On the inside, there's an insert. And in it, you'll find at the very top, Growth Track Step 3. Now, I want to do something a little different and encourage you that even if you're not involved in leadership, but you've been going here for a while, pop in. Say hi to people that want to connect with our church. They want to be part of our family, the community of God here. And I would highly encourage you, instead of uh, making a mad dash for the door, trying to beat the lines at lunch, I don't know how that is, I got you, they get pretty busy on the weekends, but instead of making a mad dash, connect. You meet with some people, get to know the rest of our family as we continue to grow and engage together in God's house, okay? Second of all, my personal favorite, near and dear to my heart, small group ministry. It is going on now. And uh, I know that most of you are very aware of that. Um, and some of us are kind of getting back into the routine. Life is beginning to kind of get some semblance of normalcy. Uh, probably not quite. Uh, I've been in a very intentional prayer for you parents that are doing hybrid learning. I see your uh, stresses and, uh, and you air them on Facebook. So uh, Lord bless you. And uh, I know it's difficult. I can't imagine. But small groups, really, if you have an idea for one or you're wanting to connect, the beautiful thing about our small group ministry here is you can jump in at any time with most of our groups. It's pretty easy to do. Um, I know that there are two groups in particular that are on marriage. So if you're sitting there next to your spouse and you're like, well, we don't need that, you should probably check it out if that's your first thought. So <laughs> if that's the first thing that comes to mind, because we can always learn, we're always growing. If you stop learning and you stop growing, you're probably dead. So, and nobody just wants to lug you around like weekend at Bernie's, okay? So please, be actively engaged. See how you can continue to grow and thrive in your marriage and your relationships. And there are others as well. But take a look. Check out our app if you don't already have it. And uh, sign up. See what's something you like. And if there's something on there that you're going, none of these work for me, guess what? Maybe God's calling you to start something new there. Pitch the idea. Put it online. Submit it to us. We'll check it out. And we'd love to come alongside you and watch as God uses your unique personality and gifting to minister to other people. And remember one thing, and I sent this out to our leaders last week. Small groups are not just for the people that are coming. They're for you as well as a leader. So if you're leading a small group, it is just as much for you as it is for the people that are coming to meet you in that space. Now, here's the one that I feel like we should have like a liability disclosure signed. Um, if you look at the very bottom of your worship insert, kickball. We, obviously many of you know, we are very competitive at FCC. Um, very godly about it, but very, very competitive. Um, people, people have been known to get injuries and miraculous healings. So, but look, make sure you have great insurance Sign up. It's going to be a good time. We're going to have fun. It's going to be intense. Um, you're going to learn some things about yourself and try not to get injured. And if you need to, use this week to kind of get yourself amped up a little bit. You know, hit a couple of Mountain Dews, get your game <laughs> face right, get your mind right, and come out. It's going to be good community. It's going to be good fun. Now, I did not say this in the last service, but it seems in God's divine providence that I must mention this. Um, if you have, happen to have a phone on, um, would you silence that for me? And uh, let, me, let me explain. We had a Halloween moment on one side of the uh, sanctuary, and then the other one, somebody accidentally called 911. So <laughs> I do not want you to have to deal with that stress on this beautiful Sunday morning. Amen? So I'll talk to you, but I won't get distracted because God is in this, right? But... I'm just trying to help all of us as a whole because then you get this little chime in your head the rest of the service and, or you're worried about calling authorities. So that being said, um, if you're here with us the first time too on the main insert, 
man, fill out that perforated thing on the side there, the connection card. Put your information on there. We're not going to blast you with a bunch of stuff and drive you bananas. Uh, we just want to know how we can connect with you and love on you and minister to you where you're at. So if this is your first time here with us, thank you for being here, really. You've been doing anything else, but you determined that you were going to come and worship with us this morning in his house. So uh, God bless you, and thank you for being here. We're honored that you would join us. So we're still in our series, The Just shall live by faith. And I say that with intentional pauses because that statement is so poignant. It's so powerful. It holds so much weight for us as believers. The just shall live by faith. If you can wrap your mind around that series title just by itself, you will understand the gospel. And if you understand the gospel then everything changes. Last week, we talked about the just. Who are the just? Who are not? Because the Bible does make a distinction. Not everybody, and I know it's a hard truth to hear, not everybody's going to heaven, y'all. Would it be easier that way? Some of us think so, sure. But it's just not true. It's not what God teaches us in his word. And we need to understand, who does the Bible identify as the just? And how are they just? And that's in Jesus Christ. And who does the Bible clearly identify? Who is unjust? It doesn't take long for you to look around in the culture and and the current standards of our society to see, wow, I can take the current cultural scene and set it right on top of Romans 1. Where we live in a culture and a community that suppresses the truth and unrighteousness, that rejects God, and that celebrates things that you and I and what the holy God of Scripture would call sin. So today, we're making a pivot. If we understand who the just are and who the unjust are, then the next section naturally for us is to gather us. How then shall we live in light of that truth? If you are a believer in Christ, if you've been paid for by the blood of Jesus, then how then shall we live? How do we live in light of that truth? So this morning, we're going to start off with our New City Catechism. And the question is this, what is prayer? And as a church, prayer is pouring out our hearts to God in praise, petition, confession of sin, and thanksgiving. You know, I want to put emphasis especially on that last part in thanksgiving. We tend to live our lives in, our prayer lives in crises to crises, don't we? Like everything is falling apart. Um, COVID is crazy. I'm about to fall off the cliff. Help! And that's okay, right? It's okay to sometimes just pray, Lord, help. You don't have to have some elaborate King James prayer because the God of heaven knows what you need before you ask. But nonetheless, I would encourage you, take count of how faithful God has been and how blessed you are and send up praise of thanksgiving to him. When you pray, God, thank you that it was 63 degrees this morning in Louisiana when normally it is blazing hot all the time. God, thank you that there's sunshine, that you keep the world spinning, that I have air in my lungs to breathe. Thank you, God, that I have people that I'm around that love me, that I have a church I can go to and I won't go to jail as a result. We could spend the rest of this message just on that, thanking God for what he has done and what he continues to do in our lives. And sometimes I understand that's hard to see when crises come and challenges come our way, but never forget to enter into that that prayer space, however you do that, with thanksgiving to God. That you and I are here for one more day, one more opportunity, one more chance to send up praise, one more moment to share the gospel with somebody, one more minute, moment to be in the hands of our maker as a tool for his glory to watch lives changed for an eternity. Every moment matters. Right now counts forever. Now, as I did last week, um, I read from the Westminster Confession of Faith Uh, No, I'm not trying to turn all of us into a bunch of Presbyterians, but it does capture what I am trying to communicate in this message this morning. So it is not on the slides. I'm going to read it for you, and then we'll go ahead and dive right in, okay? So it says, This sanctification is throughout, in the whole man, yet imperfect in this life. 
There are abiding still some remnants of corruption in every part. Whence arises a continual and irreconcilable war, the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. You see, this is war. This is internal war that's going on. It's describing. But it says this, in which war, although the remaining corruption for a time may much prevail, yet through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerate part does not overcome. And so the saints grow in grace, perfecting holiness and the fear of God. Now, I know that's really wordy, and that was a little lengthy, but understand this. If you latch on to anything, know that though you may wrestle with the flesh for a time, the sanctifying spirit of Christ will not be overcome in your life if you're a believer. That he who dwells in you is more powerful than the challenges and the sins that you battle against on a daily basis. That is how good our God is. That he sets us apart and justifies us like we talked about last week in Jesus Christ. But then he gives you this immense power by his Holy Spirit in you to know that victory is already won and this is just part of the dying breaths of the flesh that fights against us. My first point this morning is this. The Christian experience is one of tension between saint and sinner. Now, some of us, myself included, I didn't grow up hearing a lot that, hey, you're a saint, but do you know that if you are in Jesus Christ, the scriptures call you a saint? You are a saint of God. I'm not saying somebody needs to paint a picture of you and hang it on a wall or anything, but if that's your thing, just do it in private. <laughs> but you are a saint if you are a believer. You are. You say, I don't feel like a saint. Me neither. Me neither. But you're also going to wrestle with the sinner that still resides, the flesh that's still there. You know, there's this thing that I hear sometimes, and it makes me so frustrated as people say, come to Jesus and all your problems will be solved. <laughs> if you've ever heard that, my apologies, somebody lied to you. Because here's the thing, your eternity is secure, but your life changes forever, and the things that did not jump out and bother you before weigh on you heavily now. Because they matter to God, they matter to you. Bless you. We're in tension between saint and sinner. Martin Luther said it this way. We, at the same time, are just and sinner. At the same time. We live in this space. This is our day-to-day -day experience. This is why some of us will be in here on Sundays and we'll be pumped up and we're excited and we're like, man, today's the day I'm going to go out and do it. And then something happens, whatever circumstance it is, and you're frustrated, and you're angry, and you kick the dog. I hope you don't kick your dog, but maybe you do. And you're like, man, I don't even know if I'm saved. Oh, my goodness. And you have a rough day. You live in this tension. You ever seen those movies? Um, I mentioned in the last service, The Mask. Uh, some other movies do the same thing. It's a common joke. But where there's a character in the film or TV show you're watching that's supposed to die, but they die really slowly, like it takes a long time to get there. So they pretend they get shot, they fall on the ground or whatever, however it happens, and they're just like, ah, oh! and then it's like five minutes later, they're still rolling around and writhing on the ground. Oh, I'm going almost there. You know, keep having that conversation. It's goofy, but it happens, right? And the point is that we should look at that and be like, wow, that's funny. But here's the thing. The flesh that lives in you and I is in the death throes all the time. It's always trying to, like, it knows the flesh has been defeated. Victory is secure in Jesus Christ. But the flesh, the old man, wars against it in desperation. There's a plea there, a desperate plea. I'm going to push everything I have against this. I'm going to resist this so much. But they know they're defeated. Anything that you've ever seen, and you can ask our very awesome uh, big game hunters in the room, I'm sure they'll tell you, when a lot of things go to die, they, they, if, if they have the ability, they struggle to the end. They struggle. And sometimes you wonder, you're like, where does this supernatural strength come from? They're, this, they're, they're in the death throes. They're, they're going to die, and they have nothing left but to give everything that they have in their capacity for survival. And yet, Jesus Christ has secured the victory for us. So understand, when you fight against the flesh, the flesh is in the death throes. Desperate. The evil one, the devil, Satan, he understands that he has been defeated as well. 
And he's going to try to trip you and trap you, try to get you to stray from the path. He is defeated as well. And he knows. This is no surprise. No surprise at all. In Matthew 26, 41, it says, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Isn't that true? We'll come to church, we get filled up, we get in the word, we get home, and you're like, I was going to do these things, but then life happened, or I'm tired, or I don't know if you're like me, I almost never get them, so look, full disclosure, but like Sunday naps seem to be like the best naps ever, and I never get them, but I always wrestle with that urge when I get home, I'm like, man, I could take a little nap, this would be great, <laughs> and no, but the flesh is weak, like I could be doing other things, I could be ministering to my wife and kids, I could be reading the word, we could continue talking about the sermon, I really want that nap though. And that's a flesh thing. It's a flesh, because it's about me. That's what I want. When there are other things that I could be doing. And Paul paints this so well. Because if there's anybody on anybody's list that we ask, hey, who would you like to meet from the history of Scripture? Bible times is usually how it's worded. Paul inevitably shows up every time. People put Jesus because they feel like they have to put Jesus, you know, because he's God. So I, I want to go to him because he has all the answers. So he, Jesus is always on there. But when you get down to the, the Joes, if you will, Paul. Paul's there, right? Some people think Peter. Peter was kind of reckless to me. I don't know if I'd want to meet Peter. <laughs> but, um, but Paul. Paul shows up. And this is what he writes in Romans 7, verses 21 through 25, if you have your app or your Bible. It says, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And sometimes we read that passage and we go, he's screaming, wretched man that I am, like he's hopeless. He's setting up something very different in his tone there. You see, because his cry, wretched man that I am, he understands in this moment, he's a Christian, he understands in this moment, he's not saying, wretched man that I am, what can I do about this? He knows the answer. His wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So he sees this tension, he exists in this tension, just like you and I, no such thing as a super Christian, right? We play that role a little bit, but there's no such thing as a super Christian. Paul dealt with the same things that you and I deal with today. He did. Did he write two-thirds of the New Testament? Yes, he did. Would I challenge him to a theological argument? Absolutely not. The man is brilliant and God used him mightily, but nonetheless, he was a man. He was a creature before his creator, and he wrestled with the old man that was still within him. To understand that is the truth of the Christian experience. If anybody tells you that this journey is, is easy, it's not true. But if they tell you it's secure, it's absolutely true. You are secure in Jesus Christ because of what he's done. And the rest of the journey is, uh, is quite the ride to the glory of God. As we learn and we grow and sometimes we take steps away and God drags us back. He never moves. We move. Praise be to God that he always receives us with open arms. Charles Spurgeon said, Beware of no man more than yourself. We carry our worst enemies within us. You know, uh, I, I shared in the last message about sometimes uh, we're our worst critics, are we not? We really set ourselves up. Um, I've done it in the pulpit. I've done it in other public speaking settings. I'm sure some of the other pastors here have experienced this. We, we have to guard our minds in the moment to not rabbit trail somewhere, or to be thinking about, did I cover that right in the last message? Knowing that God will work through the words of his scripture because it's his power, not mine, that changes hearts and minds. I'm just an instrument in his hand, right? But if I focus too much on, man, it is really quiet in here, and I've done that. <laughs> I've done that before. Oh, it's really quiet. I can get lost in the moment, and now my focus is where? On me and not on him. We carry our worst enemies within us. We really do. Or when you're going about and you're wrestling with something or struggling with a particular sin in your life and you go, man, I don't even know if I'm saved. 
God's not going to accept me back. That's your worst enemy within you. Because the scriptures doesn't teach that, folks. God is a good father. God has plenty of mercy and grace for us. God understands that we are fragile and weak beings. And that we need his power to live according to what his word teaches us. And if you've ever tried to do it by yourself, you have failed. And failure sometimes is a great lesson. I have failed. We try to do all the religious stuff right, and we ultimately end up failing. And then we feel defeated because we listen to that inner critic again that lies to us and says, you're not worthy. You're not worth it. God won't take you back. Never believe that for a moment, folks. That is not the God of Scripture. If you were bought with the blood of Jesus, that will never change. You couldn't earn it. You can't lose it. My second point is this. And this one we're going to stay on for a little bit. We must guard our hearts against self-righteousness. You see, we have this spectrum that we exist in. Either we say, I'm free, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die and do whatever I want. Or I've got to do everything that the religion says I have to do and then some to make sure that I'm okay. Some of us do this thing where we'll come in and we'll say, okay, there's 10 ministries. I want to be in all 10 ministries. Let's be real. Do fewer things with excellence than spread yourself so thin that you do other things half-heartedly. But see, the reason, the motive behind this is what matters. Because the reason we pursue and sign up for so many things a lot of times is because we're trying to project a false image of self-righteousness. We'll come in here and be like, hey, that's my chair. I'm going to sit there. I don't see it in this church, just to let you know. Uh, but I've been in churches. That's my chair. Why are you in my seat? Or, hey, y'all, check this out. You, don't, you need to know this, man. I went out to this thing. We had this revival, and I got 35 people saved. All right? It's like, you did? Really? <laughs> Let's talk offline. Because <laughs> I don't think we're on the same page. But, no, I mean, and, and it's okay to celebrate certain things, but you know what kind of people I'm referring to, do you not? Sometimes we're those people. Sometimes we make it so about us that we show up and are like, man, I'm on every dream team. I'm in every small group. Like, did you go to all of them? No, like once. But I signed up. I'm in all of them. Like, well, that's cute, but you're not getting anything from it. We want, the, see, the motive matters. The motive of our hearts matter when we commit to something in God's kingdom. And Tim Challies had an article. Uh, he's a guy that writes some, some pieces about practical church and theology and stuff on Facebook. And I shared it. And he says in his article, it's not the number of activities that we participate in in the church. It's the measure of how we feel the freedom of that or the captivity. If you're signing up for so many things because you feel like you have to, you're a captive. You've created your own prison to trap yourself in. That is not biblical freedom. But if you feel free to choose and say, I want to be a part of this because I want to make his name great and I want to do life with these people, that's a very different motive. It's very, very different. You know, I grew up in a um, pretty old school church. Um, you know, by God's grace, I learned a little bit from it and God used that to minister to me over the years. But there are some things that I have learned over, as I've gotten older that were absolutely absurd that we did. So I grew up in a church that told women they couldn't wear pants to church. Can anybody in here point me to a scripture that says that is unacceptable? No, right? <laughs> I grew up in a church that said, oh, well, maybe you shouldn't raise your hands in worship. That the men should sing really low and the women should sing really high. And that you shouldn't use the voice that God gave you, however that sounds. I mean, some of it sounds like nails on a chalkboard. I'm not the greatest singer. But use what God's given you. And yet we create all these rules and regulations that we impose on the text thinking that somehow we will garner God's favor based on what we have done. And it traps us. And it's toxic to our hearts because it gets into the, 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 the roots go deep with self-righteousness. They go so deep. Because you may be in a position like that and you don't even realize it. You'll show up on a Sunday and be like, yeah, I'm here. I'm always here. Where were you last Sunday? And they're like, I'm sorry I was in the hospital. Forgive me. <laughs> but people, we will we'll do that. We'll do that because our flesh is weak. We're inclined to self-righteousness. 
Because we live in a culture that says everything in this world revolves around who? Me. Everything revolves around me. Why do you think so many people are frustrated with the culture right now? Because it's all about me, my needs, my wants. You're not doing that right. I'm offended. Everybody's offended about everything. Can I tell you the truth? Full disclosure, man, that was a struggle for me when I was in chaplain school in the Army because you've got to walk on pins and needles all the time because you may upset somebody by just saying the smallest thing. Why? Because everybody is concerned about me, myself, and I. And that's the kind of self-righteousness, you guys. It is. It's, it's selfishness and self-righteousness because when you get what you want, you go, now look at me. Look at me. I'm wonderful. I'm great. And what a misstep that is. And I'm not here to tell you today even to do the exact opposite and start lashing yourself at home like Martin Luther did and be like, man, I'm awful. But understand that as we decrease, he can increase. One of the greatest things one of the instructors told me when I was in Bullock is he would come up and he would share a moment, share, a, he'd call them nuggets, nuggets of wisdom, and he would label them gold, platinum, whatever, weird thing, but it worked. And he would say, look, I must decrease so that he can increase. That needs to be the posture of our lives. God, I, it's not about me. It's not about me. Use me however you seem fit, however you deem fit for your glory and for your name, God. And if that means that I sign up for one group or serve on one team, then I'm going to do it to the glory of God. And that means if I'm physically unable to do certain things, then I will find a way to be connected to your community to make your name great. Why? Because you are so good and so gracious to me. That while we were yet sinners, you died for us. There are no surprises with God. We work from a posture of gratitude versus trying to earn it, trying to impress God. If you think you're going to impress God, you're sorely mistaken. And so am I. So am I. You can't do enough things to impress God. God doesn't need your works. God is sufficient all by himself. And yet he calls us to enter into a relationship with him. Draws us to himself. And gives us the power necessary to make him great amongst the people that are so desperate, so lost, and so dearly in need of hope. People now more than ever need hope. If you look through anything, any situation, whether it's the political season dynamics or racial tension or um, marriage challenges, understand people need hope. They are looking for hope. And as wild as this season is, I am, I can't say certain because I'm not God, you can't say certain, but I feel really good that we have an opportunity as a church to shine like we've never shined before. To be a powerful light on the hill. To be salt and light to a dying world. This is the moment. This is the moment that you and I, by God's providence, have been given. What will we do with it? Will we waddle in self-righteousness and say, hey, I hope you show up to my church. I look pretty good. I got a assigned seating. <laughs> you can't have it, though. That's my seat. Or will we be like, you know what, God? I'll do whatever you need me to do. Whatever you call me to do in this life, I just want to do it well. I just want to do it well. I just want people to see that when you have, when you impact and you have a connection with the God of sacred scripture, something changes. And that great hope that we get from that relationship is what people need to see and it's what they need to hear from us. And I'll remind you, like I said last week, though, don't go out here thinking that you're going to have to start dunking people and baptizing people on the streets because you, you're going to say a couple of words and they're going to do it. The power to change hearts is in God's Holy Spirit. We just get to participate in the process of sharing the news. We're just messengers. We're just ambassadors of Christ. That's what we are. And sometimes I think we belittle that and we, we think too little of that. Oh, we're just, you know, just going to go out there and share a little gospel track. No, I am living proof. You are living proof that when God enters into a space, he changes everything. Everything changes. It's undeniable proof that God is powerful and working in people's lives. You know, in uh, Luke 18, 11 through 13, I love this. He says, 
There's a parable being shared. He says, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Do you see yourself in that space? Not the, hey, I'm here four Sundays, maybe five out of the month. I give regularly. I'm involved in everything. But do you see yourself in that moment? Even if you do those things, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy, God. I don't get it right. Even as a pastor, I don't get it right. Ever. Ever. And it's just the truth of the journey. But have mercy on me, God. Because I know what I am. I am, I, I am dust. And you are God. And I have life because you've given me life. And I draw breath each moment because you've given me that very breath. Because you're a good God. And you're merciful. So have mercy on me, a sinner. When you read that story, find yourself inclined towards the tax collector rather than the Pharisee. Because if you take the tax collector story out, isn't it real easy? Isn't it real easy to read that story differently? The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give tithes of all that I get. If you didn't have that second half of the tax collector, it'd be real easy in 2020 to go, sounds fine. I'm glad I'm not like them heathens. I'm glad I'm not burning people's stores down. I'm glad I'm not out here causing violence and, and murder and assaulting people and all those kinds of things. We could do that. We can fall into that, can we not? We can fall into that trap. And yet, but the tax collector standing far off wouldn't even lift his eyes. Wouldn't even lift his eyes, folks. Beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Isn't that so much sweeter? God, have mercy on me. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Never buy in to the inclinations of that inner man that tells you things about yourself that simply are not true. I'm not telling you to beat yourself up, but be careful. The higher you go, Further you can fall, right? Let the king be the king and you just be willing to serve him in any way that he calls you because he's a good God. And point number three, our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. I love that song and that point fits so perfectly, I think, as the final point for this message. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Not his mercy is adequate or that it's sufficient, which it is, but that it's more. You cannot sin so much to the point where the mercy of God will not meet you. You cannot do it. There is no end to God's mercy for those of us that are in Christ absolutely none. And yet we'll look at something like that and be one to one. God, I had a really rough week. I need some mercy. But I don't know if God's going to receive me back. I don't know if I'm worth it. You ever thought about it this way? And this really caught my attention years ago. How, how actually self-righteous is it of me to tell God what he can and cannot do? How wild is that? Usually it's out of a posture of I'm broken and I don't think God's going to accept me back. God's not going to give me mercy. But a lot of times, if you think about it, we're putting something on God that he doesn't say. That he doesn't say that. God is a good father. He's not ever, if you're in Christ, going to turn you away. And you know why? Because you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you're in a battle. And you'll be in a battle to the end of your time here until you and I enter into glory, right? 
1 John 5, 4 through 5 says this. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except for the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? You want to know how to overcome the world? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and his power and his mercy and his grace. We always need to bear in mind the truth that God is merciful. You'll never be able to sin and burden God so much that you will catch him off guard. You will not. You say, get out of here today and have a crazy day and think I had it all together. Cry out to him. And he will lift you up and we'll do it again. And when you fall, fall well. Fall forward if you can. And sometimes you'll end up on your backside in life. Because life is hard, is it not? Life can be very hard at times. And yet there's a God that is always and ever present in my life and in yours to pick you up back on your feet and say, son or daughter, another step. Let's keep going. Let's keep going on this journey together. Psalm 86.5, You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. You know, one of the things, and it, it feeds back in a little bit to the beginning, and I like how it, it encapsulates it. Paul is this brilliant theologian, an instrument of God, and writes the text for us, two-thirds of your New Testament. And in Romans 7, he has this moment where he talks about the law of God. And he is wrestling in this tension, in this space. And he's like, I know what I want to do is good, but when I try to do it, I can't. He's having a hard time with this, but he says, I recognize that the law is good. He recognized sin for what it is. So if your sins are many and his mercy is more, first you've got to recognize the sin, right? You have to have an understanding. You and I have to have a good understanding of who we are before God and what God has done in that moment to change us in his son Jesus. If we do not, we will miss the sweetness of of the mercy and grace. The entire community around us, outside of the church, does not recognize sin. The whole premise of everything in a society right now is I'll do whatever makes me feel good. And their idea is, well, I've got to get it together before I can come back. And I tell you, you know, God will draw you and change you. And you will realize, man, my sins are many. But God's mercy is so much more than I could ever ask or imagine. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of what? Of whom I am the foremost. Here's Paul again. He's like, look at me. I am the chief of sinners. I am the foremost of sinners. I do not have things together. I couldn't get up in the morning and even put my clothes on if it wasn't for God's grace in my life. That's radical grace. I've heard conversations with people over the years that tell me, God's not concerned with the small things in my life. And I would say, you are wrong. God is deeply concerned with every moment and step of your life. Every one of them. When you leave here today, God is concerned with you because you are his child if you're in Jesus Christ. And just like your own children, if you have them, you want to know where they're at. You want to know how they're, how they're doing. You want to minister to them. You want to be there to teach them, to lift them up. Sometimes even discipline them. God disciplines us, doesn't he? And yet, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, I, of which I am the foremost. And as I conclude, there's a quote from Burt Parsons. It says, Gathered worship is our weekly celebration of victory that the war is won. That the war is won. That our enemy's head is crushed. 
and that our future is secure in our returning and conquering King. Mm. I hope and pray that we spend more time realizing that when we get caught up in the vices of this life, Jesus is coming back. The King is coming. And there will be a day when there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more struggle with the old flesh. And we are promised that in Scripture. And so when we come each Sunday, we gather in weekly celebration of that victory. We come to God's house to celebrate who He is, what He has done, and what He is still yet to do. That ought to give us a type of joy to weather any storm, any challenge, and any self-doubt that we have in our lives. Let us pray, church. Father, we thank You. That though our sins are many, Your mercy is so much more, God. And the truth is, we need it. We need it all the time, every moment, every day, every hour and second of our lives. Help us be faithful instruments. Help us live in such a way that makes the truth of your gospel shine like the sun. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.